Hello and welcome to Makeshift Stories. Thank you for listening. You can help us out by telling your friends about us and getting them to subscribe on Apple Podcasts. Now, open your imagination and take a journey into the improbable as you listen to Makeshift Stories 173, Ken Likely, Accidental Interdimensional Drifter, in A Crisper Lawn, read by Mitchell II. Ken scowled as he pushed the gas-powered mower along the property line between his house and his neighbors. Neither the mower nor Ken enjoyed this part of their weekly ritual. The machine preferred munching the lush, uniform green in the center of the yard, but that area had been getting progressively smaller as of late, as local flora from next door invaded the supposedly weed-resistant grass. The machine burped on a particularly fibrous Cardus Newtons in early bloom. Both knew you had to chop the heads off the aggressive thistle before they went into seed, and their devilish spawn blew everywhere on the wind in cute, asthma-inducing fluff. Disgusted, the mower choked to a stop. Ken bent down to clear the mulcher chute, which had been plugged by the things. Ouch! He pulled his hand back, then sucked on a finger, which had been impaled on a thorn. The natural plants, a.k.a. weeds, were slowly taking over, and chemicals were not an option. Leaf, his vegan hippie neighbor, had recently made sure of that, convincing the community council to ban herbicides from the neighborhood. But Ken had to do something. While munching on his second healthy choice, cheesy chicken and bacon pot pie with homemade sauce and added artificial and natural flavors, Ken began to research the escalating lawn problem online. He licked the grease off his fingers, then noticed his laptop was unplugged, reached over his glass of Diet Pop, with sort of zero calories, to plug the thing in. The glass, which was feeling a tad ignored, and had been sort of brushed by Ken's arm, decided it wanted some attention. So, it fell over, spilling syrupy aspartame-infused liquid onto the table, the laptop keyboard, and Ken's favorite crackers which Ken had precisely arranged on a plate beside the glass. Ken's arm, now on autopilot, had plugged the laptop cord in before his brain registered the presence of sticky wet stuff racing to the edge of the table. The laptop, preferring real sugar, snapped and sparked a bit in protest as the diet drink leaked down between its keys. Ken cursed, grabbed the computer, and shook off the excess liquid. The machine screen fluttered, then went back to normal. However, Several keys zombied by the aspartame appeared to have miraculously typed in somewhat similar keywords to the ones Ken was about to use to start his anti-weed research. The first link under showing results for non-biologic weed mitigation strategies instead of non-biological weak migraines was an ad for DIY gene editing kits. Design your own plants in three or four or five easy steps, the ad claimed. Ken placed the laptop back on the table, carefully avoiding the sticky lake, then enthusiastically clicked on the link. The e-scooter took the shortest route from the end of the bay to Ken's front door, which involved hopping the curb and plowing a more or less straight path of crushed grass across the healthiest section of Ken's lawn. The navigation computer figured it had managed to extend the current charge by 0.0001% and was quite satisfied with the result, despite the horrified expression on the homeowner's face as he noted the new sort of straight, small furrow. The rider on its back had the homeowner sign off while the navigation computer weighed the efficiency of cutting across the local flora next door. It determined the friction caused by plowing through the knee-high millweed didn't offset the extra three meters if it went back the way it had come, bleeped at its rider to approve its proposed course, then took off, following the most efficient route to the next drop, by plowing a second furrow into Ken's lawn. Ken did his best to ignore the divots the courier's e-scooter had taken out of his front yard, making a note to add crush and scooter resistance to the list of qualities he wanted in ideal grass, closed the front door, then rushed to the kitchen to open his genuine, authentic, home DIY gene editing kit, which included, for a rather large, from Ken's point of view, extra fee, a wide sampling of spliceable DNA, ready for the home enthusiast to explore. 
He cracked his knuckles, then threw the instructional VHS into the video cassette machine, which had been sitting idle collecting dust since it had eaten Ken's favorite collection of 70s classic TV sci-fi. The machine was indeed hungry again, but thought twice before it mangled the new, but rather tasteless video. It preferred a diet of bad fiction. The decades-long drought had taught it some manners, so it decided to play the tape. That new batch of radical compost should be ready, planet. Looks like an awesome day to go fertilize the heirloom tomatoes in the pyramid greenhouse, man. Leaf threw his used, homegrown chamomile tea leaves into the compost tin, then made his way to the back door. Planet opened one eye, then went back to sleep. Ah, oh, the door's gone all gnarly on me again. Bummer, Leaf complained as he laid his shoulder into the stubborn thing and pushed. It ain't budging, man. Guess I'll have to use the front door, then get the persuader out to do some fine tuning. Did you hear that door? The door refused to answer. Leaf sighed. I don't get you, man. You were all cherry yesterday. Leaf headed for the front door with the compost tin in hand. Somewhat interested now, Planet did a downward dog, then followed. But Leaf had to reef on the front door to get it to cooperate. The thing suddenly gave up fighting and popped open. He found himself staring, confounded by what he was seeing, and tried to get his bearings. Bright green light fell into the hall. Planet trotted up beside him to evaluate the new situation. <laughs> she whimpered and pawed anxiously at the handwoven hemp mat inside the door. The mat briefly considered running away from the entrance before it realized it didn't have legs, so it just lay there in terror. Green something had worked its way into the door hinges and was beginning to lustily creep over the verge. The world outside was green, a bit too neon, limey green. Not the soft green of your typical midsummer morning, with dew slowly evaporating off low-hanging leaves, and blotchy-looking grass with the sun glistening off the fleeting drops of evaporating water type of green. It was more like the neon green of plastic turf and an indoor mini-putt irradiated by too many mercury vapor lights in the middle of a cold, dark winter. Whoa, man. It's like, like some Clyde's work is everywhere. Like some establishment dude scored big on environmental manipulation last night. That local wild rye seed and wild ginger was hard to find, and man, there is zilch out there now. But, uh, more than that, where's the thistles? They even had natural resistance to radiation. Kind of like the cockroaches of plants. Very cool. But, man, they're gone. They're all totally gone. Totally not present. Leaf and Planet edged carefully out the door, then tentatively looked around. A neon green carpet of what could be considered grass if one squinted hard enough was spreading from a point just outside of Kent's front door. It was visibly inching out in every direction, eating or smothering anything that wasn't plastic, metal, or treated wood. The one exception was an abandoned e-scooter in the middle of Ken's front yard, which looked like it was in the process of being absorbed into the insidious creeping menace. The e-scooter's rubber tires had been shredded, and there was a trail of running shoe shards leading back to the sidewalk. However, not a single blade of the neon grass was out of place. Leaf eyed the stuff suspiciously. I'm opting for my steel-toed work boots, man. I think you should stay here, planet. Leaf closed the door, then dug in the front closet for the appropriate protective gear. Planet barked and pulled out her winter boots. Oh, I forgot about those, Leaf apologized. Okay, let's get our feet on. Taking a clue from the shredded running shoes next to the carcass of the dead e-scooter, Planet and Leaf carefully made their way around the side of the house on the rubber sidewalk made from recycled car tires. The green mat of whatever it was, had halted at the edge of the synthetic rubber, straining to jump over it. Rounding the side of the house, Leaf abruptly halted. My pyramid greenhouse! That stuff is going all freaky on it, chowing down on the responsibly harvested wood frame. I think it's after my heirloom tomatoes. I'm feeling like I'm gonna flip out here, planet. Gaia is losing the fight, fast. We gotta do something, man. 
planet carefully pawed at a few neon green blades which had broken ranks with their brethren and were boldly exploring the cracks between the sidewalk blocks, then eyed one carefully. Look, there's a trademark, she pointed out. It says, K likely TM. Ken had just finished arguing with his new toaster. It had come free, as one of those buy 20 loaves of amazing bread and get a free toaster to help enjoy those wonderful slices kind of deals. The machine had arrived a month ago, and it had taken Ken most of that time, except for the break he had taken to play with his new gene editing kit, to figure out how to get the thing to work. For some reason, it needed an internet connection, and, as of yesterday, he had gone through all 20 loaves of amazing bread, which were only available at the supermarket across town. So, last night, Ken had walked down to the local convenience store and picked up a loaf of whatever they had. The toaster called home as soon as Ken jammed two slices of the off-brand stuff into the trademarked Perfect Toast Every Time slots and instantly received the message from head office to eject the stuff. Which it did, without question, then displayed the following message on its bright, shiny LED screen in happy letters, which pointed out, This bread lacks the correct characteristics to make perfect toast. It was careful to add a trademark and hyphenate perfect and toast. Please reorder the correct bread from our 24-hour online store. Overnight delivery guaranteed. But uh, I want toast now, Ken pointedly informed the toaster. And you're going to help. That's what you were made to do. He jammed the bread back in, this time holding down the lever. The toaster briefly pondered the nature of existence before calling home again. Having anticipated situations like this, head office told the toaster to acquiesce, but increase power to the toasting elements to incinerate the rogue, non-amazing bread slices. It's burning. What? Why are you burning my toast? Ken held the toaster upside down and shook until two desiccated pieces of blackened bread dropped out onto the counter. The toaster patiently displayed another offer to order the right bread, this time with 10% off. So, when the doorbell rang, followed by insistent banging, Ken wasn't in a particularly good mood. He was also out of his favorite cereal, and his stomach was grumbling. Go away! The e-scooter courier had been back three times, deepening the rut in his lawn, and when Ken tried to go online to the store to complain, the website selling the gene editing kit was gone. Go away! He yelled again. The banging finally stopped, and Ken turned his attention to scraping his burnt toast. However, before he had enough time to find a knife suitable for the task, the front door clicked open. Way to go, planet! You're so down with locks, man! Very cool. Leaf, is that you? You can't just break in. That's against the law. Hey, dude. We were concerned. Heard you yelling. Plus, we've got a bit of a urgent, gnarly scene happening outside, man. Leaf and Planet strode into Ken's vintage mid-century kitchen. Toaster problems, huh? You gotta use the right brand of bread, man. There's RFID chips in the crust so the toaster knows it's the right stuff. They're programmed to burn everything else, dude. You gotta cut the crusts off before you eat it, though. There's heavy metals in the RFID chips, Kenny. Oh, Ken grunted, eyeing the pile of empty bread bags he had stacked beside the garbage. His stomach grumbled again. It had been trying to convince him he needed to cut back on his carbs for a month now. What do you want, Leaf? Well, dude, we just found this next door. Leaf carefully placed a single blade of neon green grass on the kitchen table. It's everywhere, like dandelion fluff on a windy day, man. Real salty stuff. Ken went to pick it up. Careful, dude. You can cut your fingers on the edges. It's got your name on it in tiny green letters. See? Right along the spine on one side. It's why we're here, man. Ken gingerly lifted the grass and held it up to the light. They're called blades of grass, so the sharp edge thing kind of makes sense, right? 
It prevents people like scooter couriers from cutting across the lawn. But they're everywhere, man. Everywhere. And that bunk is eating through the pyramid like there's no tomorrow. It's after my heirloom tomatoes. Are you getting what I'm laying down, man? Ken looked at his neighbor indignantly. Leaf, your weeds were destroying my lawn. There was the sound of breaking glass. Planet growled and barked at the kitchen window. Ken and Leaf followed her eyes to a smashed pane over the sink. An angry carpet of neon green flowed through the opening toward a somewhat neglected-looking African violet in a red earthenware pot placed between the sink and the window. My mother's prized violet! Ken cried in surprise and darted to the window to grab the potted plant away, then placed it on the kitchen table before the razor-edged grass could flow hungrily over it. That's... That, that, that's not supposed to happen. Planet and Leaf stared at Ken, questioning. Ah, uh, I was desperate. It was your weeds. You mean the natural local flora, my man? Whatever. They were taking over my guaranteed weed-resistant lawn. I had to do something. I paid a fortune to sod my yard with the stuff. Even had to sign an agreement which prevents me from reseeding without paying a royalty. Leaf and Planet continued to stare blankly. Okay, okay, stop with the big, innocent, puppy eye thing. I admit it. I bought one of those new DIY gene editing kits. It was tailored for the home gardener with invasive weed problems. Paid extra to get the special materials package. It was guaranteed to change your lawn in two days or your money back. Funny thing is, that pesky courier wanted me to return it. Something about a mistake. But I fixed the problem with my K-likely, patent-pending, engineered grass. No more cutting across my front yard. I dare someone to try. Wanted to complain about the courier, but I can't find the online store anymore. Maybe that's best, because of that pesky guy I was only going to give them a two or two and a half star rating anyway. Every touch point counts as part of their customer experience. They should know that. Planet growled at the neon green mat, which was now spilling off the counter onto the worn, vintage lino floor. The Ken grass! It's spreading beyond your yard! Show me what you did! She barked, backing away from the creeping neon green mass. I'll never get used to your dog, Leaf. Dogs shouldn't be able to talk. That's just... It's not supposed to be. Hey, man, I know it's a heady trip, but it's not the time. Just chill and get down with what she's asking. Planet's a heavy genetic guru, and if anyone can tame that bogarting biomass, it's her. Planet began to object, but Leaf waved her down. Kenny, neighbor, dude, don't cop out on us, man. We need to know the Kengrass is taking over. It's like we're at a minute to midnight here and counting down fast. Are you digging what I'm saying? Ken looked from Leaf to Planet, who was whimpering, and giving Ken the big puppy dog eyes again. He tried to stare the dog down, but her plushy, toy look won, and he caved, shoulders slumping. I... I... I, I used the home gene editing kit to design a grass that would annihilate that nasty stuff crossing the property line from your yard, Leaf. So it's your fault. You mean the rad flora that was here way before you, me, and planet? It's adapted to the local scene, man, so it's good at surviving. Your grass is the invader here, Kenny dude. What mods did you make? Well, um, I've tried pulling them out. I've tried chemicals before you got them banned. I even bought GMO sod that was designed specifically to be Weed Whacker 360 resistant. Leaf and Planet stared, not comprehending. You know the TV ads, right? Get the perfect lawn with Weed Whacker 360. Spray away your infestation problems in one pass. The only thing left standing is your perfect GMO grass. Well, it didn't work. Your weeds were back the next day. So, I guess your herbicide ban really didn't change anything. But, in principle, I object. You were spraying herbicides upwind of the greenhouse. I feel sick, man. Not since the ban, Leaf. Your weeds must be some kind of alien space plants. Nothing until Kengrass worked. I keep telling you, Kenny, they're called local flora. Chill, man, and lay the reality on us. 
What did you do? There was a sudden crash and tinkle of broken glass. All three looked over to the kitchen window, where another pane had been smashed, shattered by the astroturf-like lawn, which was determinedly spilling through the opening. Desperately crawling toward the potted violet on the table, like a drooling coyote lusting after a domestic rabbit, Ken snatched the plant up and hugged it to his chest. Ken! Planet demanded impatiently. Okay, okay, Ken conceded, holding the violet protectively against his chest. I wanted quick results. I swapped out the chlorophyll for goat genes. The grass doesn't need the sun to survive. It feeds on other plants, specifically non-GMO stuff like your insidious weeds, Leaf. The color drained from Leaf's face. My heirloom tomatoes, man! You're violet, dude! Nothing safe! Planet whimpered. You've got to go, Planet. Really, man? You're the smartest one in the room, and we've got one mother of a creepy green plastic problem here. Can't you wait? She shook her head and scratched at the floor. Okay, okay, I'll open the door. Just get back here as fast as you can. We gotta figure this freaky thing out before there's nothing but Ken grass left. Leaf, Ken protested. The grass had rapidly spread across the floor to Ken and his violet. I know, I know, man, but Planet has never let me down before. Leaf swung the front door open and Planet raced out. Both men watched her carefully skirt the razor-edged grass, which was straining to get over the sidewalk to the boulevard and the city's local flora, which ran down its center. Hey, I, I can't move my feet, Ken screamed. It's, it's wrapped around my legs. It's after the violet. Throw the thing away, Kenny. Save yourself, man. It's my mom's. I, I can't. Leaf watched in horror as the neon green ravenously crawled up Ken's pants shredding the khaki-colored polyester. Desperate, Ken held the violet above his head. But when the Ken grass had reached mid-thigh, the stuff stopped, appeared to shiver, and began to yellow. Ha! It's planet, man! She's done it! Leaf motioned outside and laughed. Planet, positioned on the sidewalk adjacent to the brightest, greenest, and basically the healthiest part of the invading biomass, more or less on the property line where the stuff had been devouring Leaf's local flora, squatted and peed. A circle of dead Ken grass radiated away from the spot. Devastated, Ken watched his creation wither. I, um, I hadn't considered that in the design. Makeshift Stories is a proud member of the Alberta Podcast Network, powered by ATB Financial. To listen to other great APN award-winning podcasts, such as Not There Yet, Terrence C. Gannon's Insights on Culture and History from the Second Decade of the 21st Century, please head over to albertapodcastnetwork.com. Now, please listen to a few words from our sponsors who help make this podcast possible. Tired of paying bank fees when you can't remember the last time you went into a branch? You spoke. ATB listened. And they've created a no-monthly-fee digital account with a line of credit that makes banking work for you. You can find out more about ATB Financial by heading over to atb.com. This episode was brought to you in part by Park Power, a provider of electricity and natural gas in Alberta that offers low rates, awesome service, and profit sharing with local charities. In Alberta, you get to choose who to buy your energy from. Park Power has low overhead, and chances are you'll save money if you switch. You can find out how much money you would save by visiting parkpower.ca and plugging your numbers into the Alberta Energy Savings Calculator. If you decide to switch, it's easy. Nothing changes about your service, only the price you pay. Learn more at parkpower.ca. Makeshift Stories is released twice a month around the 1st and the 15th. This month's story was written by Alan V. Hare and read by Mitchell Two. Opening and closing theme, Magical Mystery by 8th Mode Music, is licensed from Audio Jungle on a music mass reproduction license. If you'd like to connect with us, please send an email to makeshiftstories at gmail.com or visit our website at makeshiftstories.com. Links to both are in the show notes. 
You can help us out by writing a review on Stitcher Radio or Apple Podcasts or any of your favorite podcast services. Makeshift Stories is released under a Creative Commons non-commercial attribution no derivative license, which means you are free to share our stories. Just remember to credit us and don't alter anything.